Hey y'all, so welcome to the video version of the CSS lecture. Um, I hope that everyone is having a great Halloween so far, and apologies again for, for the inconvenience about not being able to have class tonight. Um, so what we have here is uh, is the HTML from th th that we wrote in class last week. And then we also have a file called style.css that we'll be looking at, as well as some slides to follow along with. Um, so let's, uh, let's go through these slides. So CSS. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. And what CSS plays in, in, in creating a web page is it's actually the, the, the portion of your code that tells the browser how things are supposed to look. So as opposed to HTML, which contains the actual content, CSS is just simply instructions for styling of your document. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and it's a separate file that has a .css extension. So just like our HTML files have a specific file extension, so do our CSS files. And so it's a separate file that's loaded by the browser in conjunction with, this, uh, with an HTML document. If you just loaded CSS by itself, it wouldn't look like anything because, again, it does not actually contain content, just instructions for how other content should look. So the cascading portion of CSS, uh, it, it, it refers to the fact that selectors take precedence based on specificity and order. We'll get to uh, what those things mean. And uh, I always like to point out that a great way to learn more th about CSS is through dev tools. So for instance, if we're on, let's say, this GitHub page and we wanted to see why this particular link was blue, what we can do in Chrome is we can actually right click and click inspect. And then we'll see a list of all the CSS rules that go into this particular link looking exactly how it does. Um, if you click on a different element in your page, you have this whole element inspector. Um, you, you, you can see all the CSS rules that are applied to a particular element. So we'll take a look at this later in the semester when we're, when we're talking about uh, your next project. Um, for now, I just kind of want to introduce that because it's a really useful tool for either debugging your code or figuring out how someone else's code is working. So as far as what we're actually focused on in this lecture, um, we can spend an entire semester talking about CSS. Um, when you get to the more advanced concepts with CSS, CSS can get very, very tricky. Um, and it's also an evolving spec in terms of browser support. So, so the way, way that browsers actually implement CSS is constantly changing. Um, in the past few months, uh, browsers have actually introduced a new feature um, called the, the grid display, which completely changes uh, how you actually handle page layouts using CSS. So for the purposes of this lecture, we're going to focus entirely on text styling, and we're not focusing on layout. It's out, kind of outside of the scope of this class. So we'll touch on the essentials, but if you want to learn more, um, just come to office hours or talk to me outside of class. So I'm just going to take a second real quick to make sure that my screen is still recording. And we're good. So the first thing we need to do if we're going to, to, to work with CSS is we actually need to include CSS into our page. And there are three ways of doing this, uh, some of which are good, some of which are a little bit better, and some of which are bad. So the first uh, method is to actually include a style tag in your, in, in your head. So again, the head of your document is just going to contain meta information about your page. So uh, styles kind of fit into this. So what we can do is we can open up a style tag. So just like the rest of our tags, we have an opening style and a closing style tag. And this will tell the browser that anything between these two tags is supposed to be parsed as CSS. So just to prove that this is working, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, take this file. So let me find this CSS index.html, and I'm just going to drag this into Google Chrome so that we can look at this page. So now we can add some CSS. So a good example, let's say body background red. And now if we refresh the page, you'll see that the body is, is, is red because what we've done is we've given the browser some instructions for how that particular element is, is supposed to look in our page. Um, so going back to the slides, uh, so this is the first way, and, and this way works fine. Um, but a better way of doing this is to actually include an external style sheet. And the way that this looks is uh, you're going to have an element in your head called link. And link is going to be a self-closing tag. And link needs two properties. It needs a, a rel property, short for relationship, which tells the browser what role this document actually plays in, in rendering a page. And then you need an href, or hyperreference property, which tells the browser where a file is. So what we need to do is we need to give the, the browser instructions for where it can find the CSS file. 
So I have my CSS file saved as style.css in the same folder as my HTML file. So I can say href equals style.css and then uh, I can add something to my, my style. So we can say body background blue. And when we refresh the page, nothing's gonna happen because we actually need to give the browser the, the relation property, the rel. So we can say rel equals style sheet, and that will tell the browser that when it's loading this resource, the role that it's supposed to play in the document is as a style sheet. So we refresh the page, and then now our background is blue. So this is the first instance of what we'll, t we'll be talking about with how the cascade works in style sheets. So because we're loading this CSS uh, through our rel, after the uh, after our actual style tag, um, the, the one that comes later is actually going to take precedence. So if we were to actually rearrange this, so I'm just going to cut and paste this link tag, you'll see that the red actually takes precedence because it comes afterwards. Um, so if you need something to override another rule, which is a little bit more of an advanced concept, you can just put it afterwards and you know it will work. So then the third way of including CSS in your page is with an inline style tag. So for instance, uh, what we can do, let's say that we wanted this our h1 to be white. What we can do is we can say h1 and we can give it, we can give any element a style property and then style equals quotation marks, then anything that we include here will be parsed to CSS. So we could say style equals color white. And then we refresh the page and you'll see here that this header is now white. Now, the reason that this is kind of bad is because let's say that you have a bunch of elements on your page that you that, that you all, all want to be styled the same way. Uh, by including the inline style tag, you actually have to duplicate that same code every time. So let's say it's white for now, but then later you decide you want it to be a different color. You, you might have to update that in a whole bunch of different places. And so it's, it's, it's not the most maintainable code. Now, the reason that an external style sheet is better than including the style tag in your head is for a similar reason. Um, even though the, the style tag lets you kind of reuse styles between uh, similar elements, um, what happens is if, let's say you're, you're, you're uh, managing a site with lots of different pages. Maybe you have 10 pages, maybe you have 100, maybe you have 1,000. If you're writing your CSS via the style tag, then that's up 10 or 100 or 1,000 files that you need to update every time you need to make a change. So by including things in an external style sheet that then gets loaded by an HTML file, you can have the same file that could be used by every single one of those HTML files. And when you need to update something, you only have to update it in one place. It's a much better experience. It's a lot more maintainable. So let's get rid of the style tag and the inline style and move on. So I just wanted to introduce those concepts, uh, not because it's the right way of doing things, but just because if you're looking at other examples of code um, or you're uh, in the future, maybe you're maintaining someone else's code, um, it's, it's, it's good to be introduced to those concepts. So before we dive deep into how CSS actually looks, let's go back to HTML for a second. So there are two things that I wanna mention, and those are classes and then divs and spans. So if you need to target specific elements, um, you can actually add a property called a class. So for instance, we could say, we could take this first paragraph and we could give it a, a class property. So class equals quotation marks and say class equals bold. It doesn't actually matter what we name this class. Um, we'll see how this works in a second. So what we saw earlier with maybe targeting an H1, that works great if you wanna target every single um, H1 on your page. Um, or if, uh, if you want to target every single paragraph, you can use P as a selector. Um, so to take a look at how this works, we could say P color equals green. And so if we refresh our page, you'll see here that all of our paragraphs are actually green. And that's great if that's what we're trying to do, if we want every single paragraph to look the same. But it's likely that we don't. So let's say that we want one particular paragraph to be bold. What we can do is we can give that paragraph a class element called bold, and then we can actually use that class as a selector in our CSS. So we could say bold font weight bold. Then we, if we refresh our page, you'll see here that that text is now bold. So the way that classes work, um, again, it doesn't matter what you name the class. It has no bearing on how anything will look. You could name this whatever you want. Um, 
But in your CSS, you'll use dot, and then whatever class you've given this, and then font weight bold. You can actually also combine classes. So let's say we wanted this to be both bold and italic. I'm going to save and refresh, and then nothing's going to happen because we haven't actually included italic in our CSS. But if we go back and we add a new class, and again, we have a dot, and then the name of the class, and then curly braces, we can say font style italic. Save and refresh, and this will now show up as being both bold and italic. Then we can mix and match these. So let's say that we wanted um, this paragraph to be bold and this paragraph to be italic. Um, it, by applying those individually, we can make this look exactly how, how, how we want. Um, and just to recap this point, because it's, it, it's very important, it doesn't actually matter what you name your classes, but it's a, it, it's a good idea to name them something descriptive about how things are supposed to actually look. So naming something bold or italic to indicate those styles. So that way when someone else is looking at your code and they look at a particular class, they can tell just by the class name what your intention behind writing that class is. So there's a link here to a uh, naming convention that, that's very good. It's kind of a little bit more advanced than, than this class, but if you're curious, um, it, it can be a good thing, good thing to, uh, to, to read through. So that's the first thing that I wanted to mention was uh, if you need to target specific elements, classes can be added to them. The other thing that I want to mention is two elements that we didn't talk about last week. So those elements are div and span. And what these are used for is they're HTML tags that can give you additional flexibility without actually containing any semantic meaning. So if we look at every tag in this element, they all have some type of semantic meaning. So P corresponds to a paragraph, H1 corresponds to a top level heading, UL corresponds to an unordered list. And this is great um, because that's the, the role that these elements actually play. But maybe we want to target something uh, with CSS that, 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 that uh, doesn't actually have any semantic meaning. So for instance, let's say that we wanted to give uh, this H1 and the paragraph both a background color. What we can do is we can actually use a div tag. So we can wrap this in a div tag, which is short for division. And th this is just kind of a way of breaking your pages into sections that you can target specifically with CSS that don't actually carry any semantic meaning, that, 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 that don't necessarily serve a particular role. So what we could do is we could take this div class and we can give it a class and we could say class intro. And then now we can use that selector, so dot intro. And let's say we want to give it a background of a light gray. Um, I'll make it this instead so it's a little bit easier to see. So if we refresh our page, you'll see here that this section now has a light gray. And uh, it's, it's worth mentioning now, don't, uh, at this point in the lecture, we're not concerned with necessarily understanding um, what all of these different properties do. We're, we're, we're just concerned with understanding how the selectors work. So now, uh, we, so, so, so this is a div. So a div is a block level element. So like we discussed, block level elements will necessarily break to another line. But uh, we, we also have a tag span, which works the same way for inline tags. So about Ethan Butler, we could uh, wrap a span around this. And to just demonstrate this in action, if we, if we refresh the page, this isn't going to cause this to break to a new line because it's an inline level tag. So we can say span class equals, I don't know, name. Uh, and then in our code, we can say name color red. And then if we refresh our page, you'll see here that just this text is, is colored red without affecting anything else on the page. So uh, this is to demonstrate that if you're, if you're trying to target something and you don't actually, it doesn't make sense to wrap it in a, in a semantic tag, you can use either div or span to accomplish the same thing. Um, so moving on. So let's uh, let's talk about selectors. So we, so we've looked about we've looked at this in, in in pretty good detail so far. So you can target things either using the element name. So in this case, paragraph, or we took a look at body earlier, um, and that's just going to match the name of the actual element. So so whatever tag you're using, you can also use class. Um, so classes are the most useful because what they do is they keep your semantic meaning and style separate. So uh, 
one of the goals of, of HTML5 is to kind of make sure that w w whenever you're actually wrapping something in a tag, whenever you're using elements, there's some sort of semantic meaning behind it. That tag indicates what that content is. And it, it's it, HTML5 is in, intended to keep that entirely separate from the visual presentation of the code. And so by using classes, you can accomplish this goal. You can use selectors that only have anything to do with styles rather than what elements actually mean. Um, there's a note here about uh, using IDs. Um, we're go go going to skip over this for the purposes of this class. Um, but yeah, so this is what selectors look like. So just to recap, um, you've, you've probably noticed this so far, but for each selector, you actually have the name. Uh, and then you have a set of curly braces, and anything that goes between the curly braces after a selector will apply to that element. So you can actually uh, contain multiple properties. So you could say paragraph, color green, font size, 45 pixels. And then if you refresh our page, uh, you have the color green and the font size both applied. Um, similarly, you can actually target different elements um, using the same tags. So for let's say we wanted to make both our paragraphs and our h2s the same color. So we could say paragraph comma h2. And then that's going to select um, both our h2s and our paragraphs. And you can actually combine selectors. So uh, you'll notice that we have this intro class around uh, this div. So let's say that we wanted to target only the paragraph in our intro section. We could say intro space p. Um, you'll notice here that we're avoiding the comma that we just included. Uh, so intro space p and we could say font size 26 pixels. And then that's only going to target the any paragraphs that are a child element of this div. So it becomes a little bit more obvious when we actually indent our code. You can see here this P is inside of this div, and therefore it's going to be targeted by the CSS. So for every, uh, every property that you have, you're going to have the actual property name that you're setting. So in this case, font size, colon, the value, so 26 pixels, and then a semicolon. All of these things are essential. So if you're missing the semicolon, um, that's not going to work. If you're missing the colon, uh, that's not going to work either. Um, I think I just had semicolon and colon backwards. Please, uh, please excuse me for that. But all of these are, are essential. Um, what's not essential is the line break. So if you say font size 26 pixels, color green, um, that will work fine. But for the purposes of readability, I find that it's best to include every rule on its, uh, on its own line. Um, similarly, if I'm targeting multiple things, so intro P um, or UL, I like to make sure that all of my individual selectors uh, go on their own line. So let's move on and let's take, uh, take a look at something else. So uh, you've noticed here that we've been using pixels, PX, as a unit. And so uh, pixels correspond to one little dot on your monitor. So uh, one pixel corresponds to 172 of an inch, so 1 over 72. There are 72 pixels in, in, in one square inch of screen space. Um, other units that you might use are M. So M is equal to the font size of that element. So here, uh, for instance, um, let's say that we wanted to, um, for this intro paragraph, we wanted to set the line height equal to 2M. So uh, if we refresh the page, you'll see here that our line height is now equal. So each line uh, takes up two of the font size. Um, if we made this 3M, that will base it on the actual font size rather than any specific pixel value. Um, you also have VH and VW, which can be really useful, which are equal to 1% of the document width or height, so it actually depends on the size of your browser window. And then you have percentage, uh, the percent sign. So you, you can actually specify um, values in terms of per percents, um, which are really useful for layouts. So uh, moving on, let's take a look at uh, some some layout things. So like I said, we're not going to go into this in great detail um, just because this is something that's kind of constantly changing, but, uh, but, but, but let's take a look at it for now. So with the box model, um, elements, the, the way that you can think of elements are, are, are kind of as a box. Um, and you, each element is going to have uh, several different dimensions. So some of the more obvious ones are width and height. 
So by default, um, any block level element, so um, things like paragraphs, headings, divs, um, are going to follow this box model, and inline elements are not. So each element will have a width and a height, and for, for block level elements, that, that width is going to equal 100% of whatever the parent element is. But uh, we can actually change this. And the property for that is going to be width. So we can say width equals 500 pixels. And then now, um, you'll see here that this text is wrapping after 500 pixels. I'm going to add the background color back so that it's a little bit easier to see what we're talking about. So this section is now 500 pixels wide. It doesn't matter how wide our browser actually is, it's always going to be 500 pixels wide. And this, uh, this can be useful in some circumstances, but when you're actually working on the web, you want something that actually kind of adapts to, to, to the browser size. Uh, this is referred to as responsive design. So percentages are often more useful. So we could say width equals 50%. And then now what's gonna happen is depending on how wide our browser actually is, that box is going to resize, and then the text is going to, to wrap. So there's also a height property that you can have as part of your box model. I find that this is oftentimes less useful because you want the height of an element to depend on the width, but uh, some things, for some things like images, it can be useful to set, set a width and a height. So on that note, let's actually come in and let's add an image to our page. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to Google UNC logo, Um, we're going to get rid of that text, and we're just going to grab a URL for this real quick. Um, so we'll wait for Google to redirect. Uh, we will grab this URL, paste it into our document, and we can take a look at width and height. Um, so let me just refresh this so that we get the UNC logo. So with this logo, um, I'm just going to use image to target this because this is the only image on the page. Uh, so we can set width on this. Let's say we wanted it to be 50 pixels wide. Um, we can set that, um, or we can set the height. So now our image is going to be 50 pixels tall. We can make this something larger, um, and we can actually make width a percentage. So width 33%. Um, so that works great. So we have control over actually sizing our image. So width and height are, are uh, the, the two most obvious ingredients of the box model, but then you have others. You have margin, padding, and a border. So uh, margin and padding are really easy to confuse when you're, when you're just learning about CSS for the first time. So what they refer to respectively is that padding is the space inside of an element and margin is the space outside of an element. So this can be uh, more easily seen when you actually have something that has a background color. So if we add some padding to this element, it's gonna add space. So we would say padding 50 pixels. And when we refresh, you'll see here that we've added 50 pixels of space and that space actually goes inside the element. So between where the background color ends and where anything inside the element starts, that's, that's what padding refers to. But then we can also specify margin and this refers to space outside of the element. So if we add 50 pixels of margin and refresh, you'll see here that we've added space outside of our element. Um, so both are useful depending on what you're trying to do. Um, they're especially useful in conjunction with borders, which we'll get to uh, towards the end of this lecture. So with padding and margin, uh, what we're looking at here by saying padding 50 pixels and margin 50 pixels, this is actually shorthand. So we can also specify each of these values um, referring to a specific side. So top, right, bottom, and left. So we can specify padding hyphen top 30 pixels, then that's going to set our uh, only the top padding. So we could reduce that further to 10 pixels, um, so on and so forth. Um, you, so this works for padding top, padding right, padding bottom, padding left, and then margin top, right, left, bottom. Um, so with the shorthand, there are actually three ways that the shorthand can look. So if we say padding 50 pixels, it's going to take that, that, that value and it's going to apply it to all the sides, top, right, bottom, left. We can actually give this two values. So padding 50 pixels, 100 pixels. And what this will do is it'll take the first value and apply it to the top and the bottom, then the second value and apply it to the left and right. So we refresh and we can see this in action. Um, we can also give this three values. So we can say 50 pixels, 100 pixels, 200 pixels. And then this is going to take the first value and apply it to the top, 
the second value and apply it to the left and right, the third value and apply it to the bottom. So we can save and refresh, and you'll see here that that's the case. And then we can also give this, believe it or not, four values, in which case it goes top, right, bottom, left. So we save and refresh, and you can see here that we have uh, 100, or 50 pixels top, 100 pixels right, 200 pixels bottom, zero pixels left. Um, so it, with CSS, the important thing is that you're, you're describing things clearly. So sometimes the shorthand is going to be the most clear, sometimes setting padding top, padding left, uh, so on and so forth. Um, might be a little more clear. And then this is another instance of the, the, the cascade taking effect. So we could say a padding top equals 500 pixels, something crazy, and we save and refresh, and this actually isn't going to do anything because we're setting the padding top, and then right below it, we're actually also setting the padding top. So the second value is going to overwrite the first. If we reorder this, uh, so we can cut this code, paste it here, then this is going to work by setting the padding top uh, because this value comes second. So that's kind of a high level overview of the box model. So you have uh, width and height, padding, border, which we'll get to later, and then margin. So let's move on. Let's actually talk about display. And we're only gonna go into this briefly because this, this is a more advanced concept. So the display property um, has a box model, like we just mentioned, um, and it will cause line breaks. Um, in inline elements, like our spans, our A's, strongs, M's, there's not actually a box model. So if you try applying any of these values to it, it's not actually going to do anything. And it's not going to cause line breaks. Now there's actually an in-between version. And there aren't actually any elements that has, ha has this by default, but you can set it with CSS. And that's inline block. And what this does is that it won't cause line breaks. So just like inline elements, uh, it, it, these aren't necessarily going to go to a new line, but these elements also have a box model. So you can set things like padding. So uh, where this can be useful is I'm going to get rid of all this terrible padding. So let's say that we wanted um, our state magazine to, to have a little bit more padding. So what we could do is we could give this a class and let's just give this class um, link. So now if we want to target this in CSS, again, dot link, and we can say display inline block, and then we can say padding 20 pixels, and background color yellow. So now if we save and refresh, you'll see here that this actually has a box model, um, which, is, which is great. Uh, I mean, this obviously looks terrible, but, but uh, this is just to demonstrate the concept of how this works. If we get rid of the, the display inline block, we'll still have the background color, but uh, we won't actually have um, the, our, our padding isn't going to render properly. You can see here that this looks really glitchy. Um, so we can have inline block in order to uh, get this to, to render the way that we expect it to. Um, you can also uh, overwrite the default value. So let's say for instance, our H1, we wanted to set as display inline. What this will actually do is it will cause um, any uh, text uh, that, that, that's also inline to uh, display in the same line. So in order to get this to do anything, we actually need to specify intro paragraph as well. Then you'll see here, um, even though h1 and paragraph are blocked by default, by setting display to inline, we can actually get them to appear on the same line. So that might be something you, you might want to do. Um, a lot of sites will do this with something like background color. So we could say h1 uh, display inline background yellow. And then we have a background that only takes up the width of the heading, the, the actual text itself, rather than the full width, which is what would happen if we left this display block. Um, so like I said, uh, don't worry too much about the display properties. I'm just mentioning them because they're oftentimes useful, but they are a little bit more advanced than anything that, that you're expected to know for this class. So then uh, let's move into text properties. So with uh, these are a list of all the properties that might be useful. So the first is going to be font family. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this intro paragraph that we already have. So the, the way that the font family property works is that you can specify a particular typeface. So let's say Helvetica. And this will actually tell the browser to use this typeface. So this went from displaying Times New Roman, which is the d default, to d displaying as Helvetica. Um, 
so font uh, if you have a font name that doesn't actually have any spaces um, you can just include it as a string but if you have a font name that includes spaces the browser is not going to actually be able to understand this so you actually need to wrap it in quotation marks so Helvetica Noi in quotation marks and then it will display how you're expecting it to um, so I like to always just wrap uh, fonts in uh, quotation marks whether or not uh, you actually need them I think that it reads a little bit easier so the way that a uh, font family works is let's say that uh, you have you, you, you're specifying a font family that someone doesn't have so for instance um, I'm, I, I'm on a Mac and so there's a typeface that I really like TW send MT that this uh, my operating system doesn't actually have so with font family you can actually specify a series of callbacks so if a user doesn't have this font installed, you can give them a backup. So Futura is a really similar typeface, and that will work. It's going to look for this. It's not going to find it, so it's going to go down the line. So oftentimes you might see something that looks like this, um, where you have uh, a series of fonts displayed in basically the order that they look best, but then you're uh, as you go down the line, you're just looking for ones that are more common. So here, uh, users might not have this, but th it's more likely that they'll have Futura. But if not, then they'll definitely have Arial. And then if for some reason they don't have Arial, it will uh, display as the, the default system sans serif. So I can refresh the page, and you'll see here that this is still displaying as Futura because that's uh, a, a, a typeface that I actually have available. So a really useful resource when you're dealing with font faces is fonts.google.com, which we've kind of alluded to early in the semester. And what fonts, uh, what Google Fonts lets you do is it lets you actually load typefaces that Google hosts into your page. So this way it doesn't matter if users don't have the typeface or not because they'll actually download the typeface in a way that they, that they can use. So let's say we want to have our web page display as Roboto. What we can do is we can click the plus icon next to Roboto and it'll show us that we have one family selected. So we can click on this, and the way that I like to include uh, fonts from Google Fonts, the way that's easiest for me, is to use this import link. So we, what we can do is we can grab at import URL, and it's going to give us the URL to where Google hosts this. And then we can take this line and just paste it at the top of our document. So then if you scroll down a little bit, Google will also give you instructions for where, uh, for, for the actual CSS rule that you can use to, to, to use this font family. So font family, Roboto, and fall back to just the default sans serif. So now if we paste this into place on our page, uh, we can have the font family Roboto. And then if we re refresh the page, you'll see here that uh, we have that typeface included as we expect. So this uh this this can it can be really useful to to load uh, typefaces uh, multiple typefaces from Google Fonts. So let's say we want Roboto and then we also want some sort of serif font. So uh, Roboto slap looks great. So let's um press the the plus icon to select this font. And now if we look at this import link, it's actually going to give us two diff uh, it's going to give us a different URL which will contain both of these typefaces. So now we can use Roboto, but we can also use uh, Roboto uh, slap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, chain, uh, I'm going to get rid of this on my intro. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say body font family Roboto slab uh, serif. And then I'm going to say h1 h2 font family Roboto sans serif. And now if I refresh my page, what's going to happen is that all of my body content, uh, because we're, we're targeting everything on our page using body, is going to use Roboto Slab. But then all of our different headings are going to use just Roboto, the, the, the sans serif version. Um, so by doing this, uh, we're actually using the, uh, the cascade, um, so, so the order of selectors, in order to more accurately target our page and, 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 to, and to reduce some redundant CSS. So moving on, uh, so that was font family. Um, again, just to recap, uh, you can load fonts from Google Fonts, and uh, you can specify uh, an order of preferences for, for typefaces you, you would want to use. So other useful text properties are font style, which can either be italic or uh, some other um, values. So what's nice about Atom is if you just name a selector, or, or not a selector, but a property name, 
So font style, um, you can actually, it'll give you a list of all the different options. So italic, normal, oblique. Um, normal is just default text. Italic is italicized text. Oblique, you want to avoid. Um, oblique is basically normal text just kind of skewed to the side, which is different than italicized text, and it looks pretty bad usually, so I, I don't recommend you ever use oblique. So you can say body, font style, italic, then everything on our page is going to render as italic. Um, we also have font weight. So this refers to the actual width of the text. Um, so depending on the typeface you're using, uh, you, you may have several different variations. Um, so this kind of uh, involves some knowledge of, of the actual typeface you're using. But font weight can either be a number 100 through 900, um, so 100, 200, 300, etc. Um, or it can be bold. Um, and uh, either, of the, either of these is fine. So 400 is default. If you want something a little bit bolder, um, you can say 500, so on and so forth. You, you can play around with this. With Google Fonts, if you're loading something from Google Fonts, you actually need to specify uh, which typefaces you want or, or which, which font weight you want. So if you go into uh, the family selected screen and click on customize, you can actually specify which version you want, you want to pull in. So we can see here Roboto has uh, basically almost all of the, the different font weights. Uh, Roboto has versions of so 100, 300, 400, 500, 700, 900. So they skip a couple, but then you'll see that Roboto Slab actually has uh, a lot fewer options. And so if you were to specify, let's say, Roboto Slab 600, it's going to default to 400 instead because you don't have the 600 installed. So going back to the slides, uh, the next thing we'll talk about are text transform. So text transform, um, let's, uh, let's apply this to our headings. So we can say text transform, and Adam's going to give us some options. So capitalize, full width, lowercase, uppercase. Um, the, what I find useful here are usually uppercase. Um, if you specify uppercase, then what happens is regardless of how the text is capitalized in your HTML, it's going to be capitalized in your CSS um, or, or, or on your page. Um, so this can be really useful if you're trying to style something that maybe you don't have control over the original HTML for. Um, so moving on, uh, you also have text decoration. So text decoration is uh, can be used to maybe specify a strike through or an underline. So you'll see here that this link is going to have an underline by default. Maybe we don't want that. We could use A to target this and we can say text decoration none. Then if we save and refresh our page, uh, you'll see we just get rid of the underline. Your other options with text decoration, um, you have uh, overline, which I've never seen. That's not something that's uh, conventionally used in English, um, or line through. So if you needed to actually strike out some text, um, you can use line through to kind of cross it out using CSS. So you also have letter spacing. So if you come from a, a design background, you would this would refer to the actual tracking between letters. Um, so letter spacing, and let's say we wanted five, four pixels of letter spacing. If we refresh our page, you'll see here that our H1s and H2s now have more spacing. So uh, this, this can be really useful if you're kind of pursuing a more modern aesthetic. I find this often looks good in conjunction with uh, text transform uppercase, um, but you can also make this a negative value too. So if you wanted to make your letters even tighter, um, you can make this negative two pixels and then it'll scrunch your letters together. Um, and then uh, similarly, you also have line height, uh, which we looked at briefly. So line height, if you come from a graphic design background, is what you would refer to as letting. So with line height, um, you don't actually need to specify unit for this. So you can actually just specify a ratio. So line height 1.5 uh, generally looks pretty good. So I'm actually going to apply that to my body instead so that it affects everything on the page. So you'll see here that kind of respaced our lines a little bit in a way that uh, th th that looks pretty nice. Um, it, it's just gonna look a little bit more readable. So 1.5 is usually a good ratio. I just kind of set this on body and then kind of forget about it. Um, and then finally, uh, for useful text properties, we have color. Um, so it, this can be a little confusing at first because you might be tempted to say font color or text color, but the property is actually just named color. So with color, we can specify a named value so there are about 140 different uh, 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 color names that um, a browser will recognize. Uh, so one of them is salmon, another one is tomato. Um, you can look these up if you're curious. 
Um, but what I find gives you a little bit more control is actually using a hex value, uh, which we talked about briefly in our design lecture. So 5680D3 is Carolina Blue. Um, and a really useful resource for this is one that Adobe puts out, and it's going to be color.adobe.com. So uh, this will actually give you a tool that you can use to, uh, to kind of figure out a whole color scheme. So you can just take the slider, drag it, uh, you have some control over the color mixing, the darkness, so on and so forth, and you'll see here that for every color it actually is going to give you a hex value. So for this kind of uh, nice looking teal color, we can just copy and paste this as a hex value, save and refresh, and then that will be used instead. So I really, really enjoy using color.adobe.com to figure out colors. So moving on, uh, let's talk about some background properties. So um, I'm not going to actually demonstrate these, I just want to introduce them. So background image, you have you can specify a URL, which will uh, look for a, an actual link to an image. This can be a, a relative URL or absolute. Um, either one is fine, but uh, this will actually uh, use that image as, as the background for a section. Um, what I find is usually more useful than that is um, background color. So for body, we could say background color equals Carolina blue, refresh, and then you'll see here um, that I actually made a typo, um, so that should be AOD3, um, so we can specify the entire background color. Um, background images uh, are just kind of out of design vogue, so uh, they're a little visually distracting, which is why I'm not going into, into detail. Um, you can also, uh, if you're curious, you can uh, look into specifying gradients, which which can be really fun. That's a design trend that's kind of come back in uh, the past year or so. Um, but I think that background color is generally the most useful. So then if you're specifying a background image, you can uh, actually specify the size, the attachment, which indicates if it moves with or without uh, the browser scroll, and then uh, whether or not that image is supposed to repeat. Um, so these are things that I would encourage you to play around with yourself. Then finally, uh, we will have uh, our border properties. So border properties uh, can also follow shorthand. So we can say border one pixel, solid black. And what this does is it will add a one pixel solid black border on this intro section. So we can make this three, four pixels, and then you'll see it, it'll show up a little wider. So border needs three values. It needs a width, a style, and then a color. So we can specify each of these individually. So border width, 10 pixels. We refresh, and then you'll see that uh, we have a 10 pixel border now. Of border style, typically you'll just be using solid, but there are some other options. So dashed, for instance, um, will give you a dashed version. Um, you have dotted is a good one. Um, so, so there are a bunch of these that, that you can kind of explore yourself. And then finally you have border color. So we can make this either a color, a named color, or a hex value, either one will work. Um, so CSS is, can be a lot more complicated than what we've gone into, especially if you're, you're managing very large sites. Uh, being organized about your CSS can, can be tricky. So some steps that I would take would be making sure that you're using classes whenever av available, because classes, again, are, it separates the actual semantic meaning of your elements from, uh, f from the actual visual appearance. And it, it, it's really useful to kind of abstract those, those two things separately. Um, so we've talked about some things with uh, with the box model, with width, height, uh, border, margin, padding. We've talked about some useful text properties, and then some some useful things for for coloring. Um, so there's a lot more to learn, and if there's ever anything you're curious about, I would encourage you to shoot me an email or come to my office hours, and I'm always happy to send you on the right direction. So uh, there's an op optional homework assignment that I would really encourage you to go through. So if you go into the class folder and go into resources. Um, you'll see uh, in web graphics, you'll see exercise CSS. And this works similarly to the exercise for HTML. So I'm just going to grab the raw version of this um, and paste it in place of my document. And if I refresh the page, um, you'll see here that there are some uh, instructions that you can follow. So just basically different tasks to practice everything that we've gone over in this lecture. Um, so there are some, some, some instructions here to get started. And like I said, uh, this is ungraded, but uh, it just in order to make sure that you get the concepts properly, I would really encourage you to go through this. And we'll actually take a look at this as a class uh, during Thursday's class.
Um, so that's basically all that I wanted to to, uh, to cover um, in tonight's class. So again, um, apologies for any inconvenience about the fact that we're not having class tonight. Um, and we will go over, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all have in Thursday's class. Um, so with that being said, uh, I hope everyone has a fun and safe Halloween and I'll see you Thursday.